again, welcome everybody to this 14th edition of our virtual seminar on precision physics and fundamental symmetries. It's a great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Reinhard Pohl, who is currently a professor at the University of Mainz in Germany. Randolph uh, did his PhD at ETH Zurich, where he graduated in with the discovery of uh, the long-lived 2S state in muonic hydrogen. From 2001, he was setting up a laser spectroscopy experiment for muonic hydrogen at PSI. In 2005, he moved to the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics in Garching to develop and set up the laser system for this experiment. And as far as I remember, in 2000, of sweat and tears, I'm sure you, you will know after the talk, um, he performed first laser spectroscopy of muonic hydrogen, a measurement which was the starting signal to what is today known and recognized as the proton radius puzzle and which made it already into uh, physics history. For this elegant experiment and the surprising results. Uh, Randolph is very well recognized, got several research prizes, fellowships, grants, and so on and so forth. And in 2016, he was appointed as a professor at the University of Mainz, um, where he continues his very successful research. Randolph, uh, we are very happy to welcome you today, and we are looking forward to your talk. Now the audience is yours. Thanks a lot, Stefan. And uh, thanks a lot, Stefan and Klaus and Christian, to, to uh, set up this wonderful uh, seminar series uh, on the internet. And um, uh, thanks for, for having me. And, you know, um, I'm broadcasting live from my uh, prepper basement here, um, where I give my, my lectures. And actually, you know, everybody said that I was crazy when I said the pandemic will come, but now I'm the only person here with toilet paper and pasta. Okay, that's so far it. Um, I will talk today about uh, muonic and other atoms uh, where we do atomic physics and nuclear uh, physics. And uh, we have, uh, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to, to, to uh, thank uh, our funding agencies. And uh, as, uh, as Stefan said, I'm uh, at the uh, Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, um, but uh, part of this uh, important part of this work has been done at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in, in Garching. Today I'm going to give you an update about muonic hydrogen and this so-called proton radius puzzle. I will tell you uh, some uh, news about uh, new experiments that have uh, come up. Also, we have just submitted a paper and we're about to submit another one, which has some um, uh, importance to this proton radius puzzle. And um, then I will talk about what we're doing uh, at the moment, namely uh, we want to measure not the charge radius of the proton, but the magnetic radius, something like the magnetic radius. And then I will, I will talk about the uh, other things we plan to do in, in the mid-term to long-term future. Looking at my view of the universe, um, it's rather easy. Each uh, nucleus of the light nuclei has a, a number associated with it, and this number, uh, which is given here in femtometers, is um, the RMS charge radius. And um, uh, all of these have been measured in elastic electron scattering, which has been the workhorse for determining nuclear properties over the last uh, decade. And um, down here, you see uh, hydrogen and deuterium. These are the only nuclei so far where precision spectroscopy uh, of atoms, laser spectroscopy of atoms, can be related to um, a value of the charge radius, an absolute value of the charge radius, because uh, people can do QED of these simple two-body systems to astonishing accuracy of 12 digits or so. And with that, um, and with equally um, precise measurements, one can uh, get to the ripple constant and to the charge radius, for example. For um, the other nuclei, um, laser spectroscopy, for the other atoms, laser spectroscopy has been performed, but the theory or the experiments are not precise enough to determine absolute charge radii. And therefore, the, uh, um, but what you can do is you can get the difference of charge radii, the difference of squared charge radii. So for example, the helium-6 nucleus has been related to the helium-4 nucleus by measuring the isotope shift. So a change of, of frequency when you go from one isotope to another one. 
And um, then if you take out the trivial scaling with the different mass, you are left with um, the non-trivial scaling with the charge radius difference. And, for, and this has been done uh, for lithium, beryllium, and, and other nuclei. For um, nuclei above carbon, um, muonic atoms have for a long time been used to determine charge radii, mainly by looking at X-rays that are emitted when you take a muon, stop it in this material, and then the muon kicks out all the electrons and uh, cascades down, emitting, for example, Lyman alpha X-rays. And these are shifted for these large nuclei significantly that you can use X-ray spectroscopy to, to determine a charge radius. And I will show you how this works. So these nuclear radii are essential, are essential input for nuclear structure, for nuclear structure and for modeling of nuclei, but also for precision tests of QED and the standard model. And uh, they uh, produce, uh, they are used to produce the fundamental constants in the code data least square adjustment of all, of all uh, fundamental constants. The proton radius puzzle is now 10 years old. Um, and uh, well, it started 10 years ago and probably at the, at the end already. Um, Namely, at the time when we made our measurements with, with muons, um, and I will show you how this works in a minute, um, we used muons to determine um, the charge, charge radius of the proton. And uh, we came up with a number which is, um, uh, was very far away from, from the established value using electrons, namely elastic electron scattering and precision spectroscopy of hydrogen. This is a, a set of 25 measurements or so. Um, um, they agreed and they gave this codata 26, 2010, 2014 value of the, of the charge radius at 0.88 femtometer. Um, and when we came up 10 years ago with this, um, this different value, um, which is much more precise, but which was at that time five sigma away um, using muonic hydrogen. This is the proton radius puzzle and that um, gave quite some, some uh, um, input in, uh, or some feedback. And people got interested in this. Uh, actually, the, the, the general public got even interested by, as you see in this cartoon, where the proton uh, wakes up one morning and has lost some weight around his waist. Um, but you see already, you know, this proton has two electrons orbiting, so it's not very scientific. Um, actually, it has, has our, our nature cover has, has found its way into the popular um, world as, as well, the uh, Bosch, um, a domestic appliance service has the manual uh, where they, they covered our our cover. And I actually, I was still thinking of, of sending them an email, say, if you plagiarize our cover, at least fund our research. Okay, so the proton radius puzzle from the start was, um, was uh, not as severe as this five and a half sigma may look like, because uh, people actually before our measurement in 2010, um, a group at Bonn, had uh, evaluated elastic electron scattering data, the, the, the data that led to this point here. And they came up with a different answer, namely a, a small charge radius. And this was uh, repeated with more recent data. And then, you know, many people have, have looked into this and, and uh, found vastly different um, results. So um, since I'm not an expert in this, um, in this field of electron scattering, I will leave it with that um, for the time being. Um, but this was maybe the first hint that the, um, this radius puzzle is the five sigma is maybe not as severe as, as the sheer number looks like. Okay. okay. Um, now let's go to hydrogen. How can a, an atom uh, give you a value for the charge radius? Um, we all know the, the famous Bohr formula and the, the Bohr model of the atom, which gives rise to this uh, scaling of the energy levels in, in principal quantum number n. And um, there's the Bohr formula. And uh, this uh, already introduces you to the first uh, constant that we will be talking about today, namely the Ripper constant, which gives the energy scaling in the, in the, in the Bohr model. But of course, you know that the Bohr model is wrong and you have to invoke um, QED and, um, and uh, uh, the Dirac equation to, to get uh, to a more realistic description of the hydrogen energy levels. And I've suppressed much of the interesting features of the hydrogen energy levels, namely the fine structure and the hyperfine splitting and just show you here some, some uh, a little bit more sophisticated hydrogen spectrum. And you will see that in addition to this, um, to this uh, Bohr scaling with the Ripper constant and all the, these interesting terms from QED and fine structure and whatnot, which I've summarized in this uh, delta term, you get rise to another term, which is pro 
proportional to 1 over n cubed times the RMS charge radius. And this delta L0 means that it's important only for S states. Okay, so here are the S states. These are the P states and these um, blobs are the wave function. And now you can realize why these, uh, this finite size effect is only important for S states because the, the radial wave function for the S states, for the 1S and for the 2S has a maximum at R equals zero and that is in the center of the proton where the P state has a minimum at zero uh, at, at the, inside the, the proton. So virtually you can imagine that the proton, uh, that the electron which is not orbiting uh, the atom in, in a, in a ball-like orbit, but is a, it's a wave function and so to say whizzing through the nucleus um, uh, it spends some time inside the nucleus and inside the nucleus it feels a reduced Coulomb attraction and therefore the energy levels are shifted. Okay, and that the 2s 2p energy splitting, which was discovered in the 1940s, which gave rise or motivation to the development of QED. Um, this is where you can directly measure this because um, you, you, you have an S state which is affected by the proton radius and you have a P state which is not affected by the proton radius. So an energy uh, measurement of the lamp shift uh, is one way to access the proton radius in, in um, uh, hydrogen. Okay. So, let's skip this. okay, so we've not worked with hydrogen uh, in, in my main experiment, but with a system called muonic hydrogen, which is a proton orbited by a negative muon. And the muon was discovered um, in, in 1936 um, as part of the cosmic radiation. In fact, it's, it's the main part of uh, cosmic rays, uh, if you're not sitting in a prepper keller like I do, but on the surface of the Earth, if you stretch out your hand, um, you have, you know, like one muon per second per hand um, coming from, from the uh, cosmic, cosmic rays. Um, and um, um, they are produced when, when high energy particles from, for example, protons from the sun reach the upper atmosphere, producing pions, and these pions decay quickly into muons. And because of uh, special relativity, um, they are relativistic. They actually make it to the surface of the Earth um, within their time. Their time, uh, lifetime is only two microseconds, um, uh, but it's sufficient time for us to make an experiment. Actually, at that time, um, when, when Anderson and Nedermeyer discovered the muon, uh, it came as a complete surprise. Uh, we had a wonderful standard model at that time. We had the proton, we had the neutron, we had the electron and the positron, so there seemed to be some symmetry uh, between electron and positron, but then protons and neutrons were all you needed to explain the world around us. And that's why people say that when Ravi heard about uh, the discovery of the muon, he said, who ordered that? Because it didn't fit the standard model. And, um, and uh, well, today we hope that the muon may be eventually cracking the standard model with T minus two, for example, being, being a discrepant from the, the value that the standard model predicts. Okay, so the muon um, has this place in the universe here. We have the, the standard model of particle physics and you have the quarks and ups and downs are the, the valence quarks of the proton. Then you have the you know, electron with its neutrino. And in the second family, you have the muon. And why we're using muons is simply due to the fact that the muon mass is 200 times larger than the electron mass. So the muon is the fat brother of the electron. Other than that, it's very similar to an electron and you can make atoms with a muon uh, orbiting a nucleus. But due to the larger mass, the Bohr radius is uh, 200 times smaller than the one in hydrogen. And the wave function overlaps. So the time the muon spends inside the proton is 200 to the third power. Um, that, that's a few million times uh, larger. That is because the Bohr radius is smaller in X, in Y, and in Z. And so you get this uh, enhancement of the power of three. And so we, muonic hydrogen or muonic atoms in general are a few million times more sensitive to the nuclear structure. And that's why we do um, this, uh, this experiment with muons. Okay, so um, if, you, if you let theorists do the theory, then you come up with this uh, uh, correct energy level spacing for the lamp shift, the 2s and the 2p states. In contrast to normal hydrogen, where the 2s state lives above the 2p one half state because of uh, electron self energy, the, um, the uh, uh, 2s state lives uh, vastly below the 2p uh, one half state because of uh, vacuum polarization, which pulls this level down. And then you see a significant finite size effect. In fact, if you look at the formula um, for this uh, lamp shift, you get 210 milli electron volts 
minus five times the charge radius squared. So that's a 2% effect. This level is shifted by as much as 2% of the transition frequency um, because of the size of the proton. So we don't have to measure very accurately. In fact, uh, we measure to 10 to minus five only, but that's still good enough uh, to get uh, a charge radius uh, on the level of um, a fraction of a percent, okay? Now you see the, the full hyperfine splitting and the fine structure and hyperfine structure. The, the P state can be calculated with very high precision because there's no overlap between the muon and the nucleus. So you have no, um, no nuclear structure effects, which are the ones that are very difficult to calculate from first principles. And uh, for the S state, we are after this small shift um, because of the proton size. The experiment takes place at PSI. Um, you all know that the Swiss have very nice accelerators, and um, everybody knows this, uh, where Stefan is probably sitting at the moment. Um, but this is not where we are. In, uh, we're not at CERN, but we are at PSI, which is halfway between uh, Zurich and Basel, uh, like some 10 kilometers away from the German border, um, in Villigen and Argau. And this is the world's strongest proton beam. It's sitting in this, in this hall. If you measure proton beam strengths uh, from, by, by looking at how many protons you get from a gas bottle uh, through an accelerator into a beam dump. This here is our beam dump, that's a neutron spallation source. And on the way there, um, the protons do the same thing as the cosmic protons do uh, in the upper atmosphere, namely they produce pions when they hit a, a carbon target. And then these pions come out of uh, the wall and this pi E5 beam line. Um, and uh, then we store them in a magnetic bottle. This is a, f a four Tesla uh, magnetic bottle configuration. And there they decay into muons and these muons are then slowed down and uh, guided around the corner. This is a, a two meter concrete block to give you the scale. This is a two meter uh, times one meter times two meter high concrete block, which shields our apparatus, which is in this five Tesla magnet here from all the background radiation produced by the pions and, and protons, uh, by the pions decaying here, the gammas and the neutrons. So the muons arrive here and then um, um, they are detected and make muonic atoms. Um, and then behind this wall, we have a laser hut and uh, the laser is, um, is uh, producing a light at 6.8 micrometers. And uh, this is overlaid with the muons produced, uh, producing muonic, muonic, muonic hydrogen. And then we do laser spectroscopy. This is Franz Kottmann. The, the father of this experiment who has been working on this um, ever since his PhD thesis. And he is really the, the guy who got this thing uh, done um, and, and pushed uh, through, through the decades of, of research. We have a sophisticated laser system. I don't want to walk you through all the details. Um, it's governed by two things. Namely, we have a muon with a, one muon arriving at a time um, and we don't know when. So we need a laser that reacts within uh, the muon lifetime, which is only two microseconds, on a random trigger. And that's not tri non-trivial. What we've settled with is a, a CW pumped um, Utabium Yak thin disc laser. Um, it's one and a half kilowatts of CW pumping. So it's always at, uh, at, uh, at full inversion. And then within a, a few hundred nanoseconds, you can get light out of it. And then we have to go to this awkward wavelength of six micron. And we do this by... Um, doubling the, the disc laser light to, to have green light from which we pump a titanium sapphire laser, which if you start with 708 nanometer and you send this into a high pressure hydrogen Raman cell, uh, you make six, uh, three Stokes shifts and then you end up at six micron. This is how our laser hut looks like. It's like a huge garage, um, but probably all, most of you have a laser hut like this, um, so you know how this thing works like. This is the heart of our setup. It's the hydrogen target uh, transverse dimensions like uh, 15 centimeters. It has to fit into a 20 centimeter borehole of our magnet. Then we have a muon detector, which is 20 nanometer thick carbon foil. There's an entrance window, the muon comes in and stops somewhere here along this 20 centimeter long path. The laser pulse arrives, bounces off this parabolic mirror here, enters um, this cavity, which is this mirror and that mirror through a tiny hole in here and is reflected back and forth. So no matter where the muonic hydrogen atom is formed, um, the laser light will, will illuminate it. And then you see, um, you make the 2S2P transition and then you get the 2P1S Lyman alpha X-ray in return. And this is detected in 20 of these large, er avalanche, large area avalanche photodiodes. And then we record time spectra. Um, this is the time in microseconds 
and uh, that's the muon lifetime, you know, and uh, here we, we, we measure the, the number of uh, Lyman alpha x-rays. 99% um, of the muons after they form muonic hydrogen fall to the ground state emitting Lyman x-rays. And this is this huge prompt peak, this is a log scale. Then we have a background which we think we understand. And uh, when we are on resonance, we get a, a, a second bump here. And that's the laser induced, we call delayed x-rays. And this is 2s, 2p laser induced. And if you're on resonance, you get the Lyman alpha. So we count x-rays and uh, then plot them versus frequency and we get such a, such a resonance curve. Okay. Um, yeah, so then people do theory. Um, and uh, this is the work of, of many theorists uh, over the last decade. And then you produce this, this formula where you get the, the, the lamp shift in Munich hydrogen. This is the QED part, which has a, a small uncertainty. And this is important for higher nuclei. This uncertainty stays small. Then there's this, uh, this effect, uh, what we call TPE. This is the two photon exchange with the nucleus where the muon exchanges two photons and it can be either elastic, so the proton stays a proton between these two vertices here, or it can be excited. And this is the difficult part. This is the polarizability. And this will be the governing uncertainty for most of our experiments. And then we have uh, the, the um, form factor insertion uh, and this is the final size effect we are after. This looks very complicated. The good news is that this has a nice hierarchy on a log scale. You see that the, the leading order uh, vacuum polarization makes up 99 point whatever percent of the, the total. The second most important term is the uh, proton size. Um, and then you have the two photon exchange, which is tiny, but the discrepancy that we have seen uh, is would be the fifth largest term. So it was from the start very improbable that this was due to a missed QED contribution or so. Actually, we've measured two transitions in muonic hydrogen because um, um, we could. And uh, um, it's very important to have these two transitions because um, they're indicated here. Um, they start from the two different hyperfine states of the ground state. And um, I told you that the S state is affected by, by nuclear properties. And the hyperfine splitting of the S state is also affected by nuclear properties, namely by the magnetization distribution mainly. And so this was, uh, if you only measure one transition, then you would get an additional uncertainty because of the unknown magnetic radius. But if you've measured both, you can make a linear combination that you get the pure lamp shift, which depends on the charge radius. And you can also get some information on the hyperfine splitting and therefore on the so-called Zemach radius, which is encodes the magnetic properties. Um, we also did muonic deuterium. And there it's important to note that you see the same difference to the old codata value. Um, um, the the uh, theory has, has advanced since we published this in 2016, and today the muonic deuterium value sits here. These two shaded bands, is the, the inner one is our experimental uncertainty, and the outer one is the theory uncertainty, which is governed by the, the um, theoretical uncertainty on the nuclear polarizability of this weakly bound deuteron. Um, the deuteron, the best value for the deuteron radius is this one, that is if you combine our muonic hydrogen value for the proton, radius and the isotope shift um, in, in normal atoms of the 1s, 2s transition, which we measured in Garching in these papers. Um, and then you get a very precise um, uh, deuteron charge radius. And that is in, in excellent agreement with the Munich deuterium value um, because this isotope shift gets, uh, gets a very precise value for the charge radius difference. That's what I told you already in the first slide. Okay. Um, Theory Munich deuterium is, uh, is also sophisticated, and this is now the governing theory uncertainty um, from the polarizability with the most uh, sophisticated calculations. Um, it's still a factor of six or so larger than our experimental uncertainty. So you can do two things. You can either say you determine a charge radius if you use this calculated two photon exchange, and this is the value that I've shown you before with this large theory uncertainty, but you can also reverse it. You can use this charge radius from the muonic proton radius and the electronic isotope shift and plug it into this formula on the right hand side. Then you've measured the left hand side here and then you get, can determine the two photon exchange. And if you do this, you get the value for the two photon exchange, which is a factor three or so more accurate than the most recent um, theoretical value. So this is a benchmark for nuclear structure calculations uh, for the deuteron where you can uh, get uh, insight into the, these two nucleon forces and um, Maybe effective nuclear modeling could be could uh, be uh, assisted by both the very accurate charge radius and the uh, more accurate um, two-photon exchange contribution polarizability. Okay, 
Um, I show you that how, how hydrogen can can also contribute to this or st contribute strongly to this, and um, 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 I want to li I would like to to remind you on on how you get to this um, charge radius in hydrogen. Now, this is a slide you've seen already, namely that the energy levels of uh, uh, of the n states principal quantum number goes as minus Rydberg constant over n squared plus the finite size, which is proportional to to the charge radius squared. Which means if you do laser spectroscopy, then you have two unknowns, namely the Rydberg constant and the charge radius, and you have to do two measurements to determine um, both of these values. And we've measured one as two s, and then you combine it with any other transition up here, and then you get correlated Rydberg pairs with uh, Rydberg and charge radius pairs. And here is the world data until 2014, um, and you see that the, the, all the data seems to cluster around this large charge radius, uh, and our muonic hydrogen value and the muonic deuterium value are, seem to be outsiders. Um, but then we, we did a measurement in Garching um, three years ago where we uh, used our 1s, 2s setup to measure the 2s, 4p transition, the second transition that you need to, to get the charge radius out. Um, and um, so uh, we, we used the um, uh, hydrogen nozzle, uh, hydrogen nozzle at uh, 6 Kelvin, um, where we put uh, atomic hydrogen in, and we have a cryogenic beam of hydrogen atoms. And usually, we use a 243 nanometer laser counter propagating to make two photon excitation of the 2s state, and that's our 1s, 2s measurement. Now we use this laser as a, a way to prepare atoms in the 2s state, and then we use another laser here at 90 degrees, so into the monitor, um, to, to measure the 2s, 4p transition at 486 nanometer. Um, if you go to the 4p state, then you get x-rays, uh, sorry, um, photons out, Lyman gammas, and these um, Lyman photons uh, um, are producing electrons when they impinge on a surface, and these are detected in a channel chart. Now, of course, in contrast to the 1s, 2s transition, the 2s, 4p transition is a very bad choice for precision measurement because you have a huge first order Doppler shift. And we got around this by implementing a, a retro reflector. Others have done this before, but I think we found a, a more sophisticated way of doing this. And then the idea is if you misalign this uh, and do not hit 90 degrees exactly where you get a nar narrow uh, Lorentzian-like or Vogt-like uh, line shape, but if you, if you misalign this, um, then you get two bumps, a uh, red shifted and the blue shifted one. And um, the center of gravity is still at the unperturbed frequency. Um, now, this is a very a challenging experiment because um, uh, you have to split the line to 10 to minus 4 uh, to get to a, a value which is uh, good enough to, to separate the two values for the charge radius. And uh, we have huge systematics, and it took us uh, four years to understand the systematics and then published. So this, this retro reflector uh, is uh, coming from a fiber uh, uh, having a special uh, lens combination um, to make a nice collimated beam and going back on a high reflector back into the fiber. And then with that, you can assure that you have very nicely counter-propagating wavefronts of the, of the go, uh, incoming and outgoing uh, 243, uh, 486 nanometer beam. And that is key to, to, um, to measuring uh, this one order, uh, this one photon transition. We have a lot of other systematics. Uh, an interesting one is this so-called quantum interference. We go from the 2S state, so we have optical excitation of the 2S state. Then we have an excitation to the 4P state, and we have de excitation to the ground state. But there is another 4P state um, very far detuned. Actually, it's 100 line width away. If you see this here, you have the 4P one half transition, and then 100 line width away, you have the 4P three half transition. And uh, in a, if you look at the quantum mechanical path, for example, if you tune the laser to that uh, lower 4P one half uh, transition, you expect the, ad, uh, the excitation to go via the laser light, and then you have um, a de excitation to the ground state. But you have a small but not negligible um, uh, probability to, to go very far detuned from this other resonance, um, and then these two photons interfere. These two paths interfere. It's like a, like a double slit experiment. And what you have to do, the radiated power is, you know, these two, this looks like two dipoles, driven dipoles, um, uh, driven with the laser frequency. And you have to uh, take the square modulus of the sum. So you have to have the coherent sum of, uh, um, of, these, two, of these two paths. 
which gives you a square of this one. It gives you a first Lorentzian. The square of this one gives you a second Lorentzian. So these are the two Lorentzians. But you have a very important term, which is the cross term of these two. And that gives rise to perturbations of the line shape. And the nasty thing about this line shape perturbation is that um, this depends on the geometry of your setup. Because you can look at this as radiating dipoles, which have a dipole moment. And then depending on where you put your detector, you get different uh, line shape perturbations. And then if you fit this with just two Lorentzians, you will get the uh, wrong result. And um, so we've investigated this effect. This effect was, was brought forward by, by Eric Hessels from, from Toronto. It had been overlooked in many precision measurements. Um, and we see it very clearly in our, in our setup because we have two channel fronts and we have a split detector and uh, we can, so these oscillating dipoles are induced by the li linear polarization of the 486 nanometer laser. And in this geometry, which is depicted here, here's our read reflected laser beam. This is the hydrogen beam. In this way, um, this photon is emitted along the laser polarization. And the other detector sees photons emitted perpendicular to the laser polarization. And then we can ro rotate the laser polarization and we can look at the signals that we see, the resonances that we record in these two detectors. And if you do this and you plot and you make a, a fit of a Lorentzian or a Vogt fit uh, versus this um, angle of polarization, you see a sinusoidal modulation of uh, the center of, of the fitted line. Okay. And these two channel fronts have a different, they have a phase shift. And um, the dashed line is an up, well, it's a Monte Carlo simulation with all the knowledge that we put in and actually no free parameters and it fits this quite well. For the 4P3 half, because the um, emission pattern of the 4P3 half is different, this is not as like the simple sinusoidal, it's uh, other functional behavior. You can calculate this and if you do the so-called Fano Fugt fit, and if you put in, because it resembles a Fano resonance, if you put in the, the correct um, uh, line shape, then you get a good agreement between all uh, measurement angles and that is the final value that we put for this. We have investigated many other systematics and um, lo and behold, this value for the proton charge radius is in agreement with the muonic one and with in vast disagreement with the, uh, the codator one. Now, um, yeah, this was a, a beginning and many other measurements that have been motivated by, by the proton radius puzzle um, uh, have now have now produced results. For example, another measurement in, uh, in the one at three s transition um, that gave again the large charge radius. Um, they measured the one at three s transition, and um, then everybody was scratching his head. Then Eric Hessels um, in in Toronto, who who got uh, who uh, reminded us about this this quantum interference shift. He um, did a, a remeasurement of the classical lamp shift, the Ramsey experiment the classical lamp shift. And uh, he has a very sophisticated way of, of measuring um, um, separate oscillatory fields um, by putting two different frequencies into the two Ramsey zones. And then he measures uh, a whole spectrum within a fraction of a second. And this is a very interesting and very nice way to measure this. I stole this, these slides from him. And uh, lo and behold, he got the small charge radius of the proton again. So now it was really, um, you know, uh, going back and forth. Um, the electron scatterers also have have um, uh, have uh, had a say on on this. Uh, this is our our accelerator in mind, the MAMI accelerator, and this is the um, um, big spectrometer hall. This is the step ladder. So you see how, how gigantic these three spectrometers are, and this is the the electron beam coming in. There's the hydrogen target, and then the electrons are deflected, uh, and they go up. And, and there's uh, the um, the detector uh, plane is up here somewhere, and you can have three different uh, detectors which you can move around to, to measure scattering angles because you have to measure um, the electron uh, cro scattering cross section of electrons and protons for different momentum transfer, and that is different beam energies and different uh, scattering angles. And then you you plot uh, this so-called form factor. Um, versus the momentum transfer. And then um, you have to fit this data and the, the charge radius can be identified as the slope of this electric form factor uh, at, at, the, um, at the zero momentum transfer. Now the problem is, is depicted in this, in this plot 
you cannot measure a zero momentum transfer because zero momentum transfer means no interaction between your electron and your, your proton. So you always have to extrapolate. And that is uh, difficult. So from the start, people have investigated how to get closer to Q square equals zero to have less of an extrapolation and to see if maybe the, the problem from the electron scattering side uh, is in here. And um, recently, um, the PRED experiment at Jefferson Lab has, um, has uh, published a, a paper on, on the lowest Q square measurement of, of electron scattering. Um, they have a hydrogen target without windows they have a vacuum chamber where the, electro the scattered electrons um, go, go unperturbed. And then they have a, a calorimeter and a gem detector to, to track the electron um, um, scattered from the, um, from, the, uh, from the hydrogen, from the proton uh, in this calorimeter. And you see if you construct the, the scattering angle and if you construct the, uh, the energy that the electron has in the calorimeter, you see these two bands here, and uh, that's the neat, the neat trick they, they use. Here's the interesting electron-proton scattering, but um, you need to measure the form factor, and the form factor involves an absolute uh, scattering cross-section, and that's very difficult to normalize. You have to know the target density exactly on the, on the fraction of a percent level. You have to know the, the uh, electron beam current uh, and the, um, the beam size and so forth. And the neat trick that uh, the PRAT collaboration has implemented is that they measure all these unknowns in the so-called Möller scattering, where the electron of the, of the electron beam scatters of an electron in the hydrogen atom in the target. And this is a pure QED effect. These are the EE uh, collisions. And this is a pure QED effect. And you can calculate this with very high precision. And that gives you the normalization to your electron proton scattering data. And so they uh, get a so-called reduced uh, um, cross-section um, to very low Q square. You see the old, uh, the, 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 the most recent Mainz data from, from the um, from Bernauer paper starts here. And they have come with two different settings. They've come significantly below this, this uh, former uh, threshold. And this is uh, what they get in terms of uh, um, electron scattering form factor from the proton. And if you compare this now with the the old uh, Mainz data, the old, not old, but with the most recent Mainz data, you see that the, uh, the, uh, the Mainz data, which uh, only starts here, um, gives you a, um, a steeper slope that gives a large charge radius, and the, the new PRAT uh, measurement favors um, a smaller charge radius. And you see here that um, um, there's clearly a, a difference between the PRAT data, which lies above the, the older Mainz data. And with that, they get a smaller charge radius. Um, so now um, everything seems to settle on the, on the small radius and consequently CODATA 2018 decided to include, uh, CODATA decided to include for the 2018 adjustment the, the muonic values and then they increased the error bar to um, not exclude all the hydrogen measurements at a significant level of, of, um, um, of um, sigmas. Um, so now this is the CODATA 2018 value. Um, um, favoring the small radius. Okay, we have just submitted a paper in Garsh from the Garshin group, um, where I'm still um, working a little bit with the, the, the guys, um, doing direct frequency comb spectroscopy of the 1s, 3s transition. That is basically a, a, a remeasurement of the same transition that led to this uh, value, but with a completely different setup. Instead of using CW lasers, like the, uh, the Paris group did, um, um, we are using a frequency comb, two frequency combs, counter-propagating to get rid of the Doppler shift. And uh, you can see if you have a frequency comb, you have a spectrum of, of uh, modes. And the central mode, of course, you, this is the desired one, which gives you the exact counter-propagating uh, uh, K vectors. Uh, but you can also drive the same transition with uh, one mode of the left and one mode to the right of this. And you get, you know, you, you get um, this excitation or this excitation. And uh, so the sum of, of uh, pairwise these modes also um, works to, to excite um, the atom. And the nice thing then is that the, uh, the, the, the mode lock to the frequency comb um, uh, excitation is the same as, um, as the CW excitation with the same average power. A big advantage of the uh, frequency comb is, um, however, that you have these pulses, and so you're your harmonic generation, which has to go to 205 nanometers, is much more efficient for the pulse uh, 
um, laser. And therefore, you combine two benefits, uh, namely uh, efficient harmonic generation to 205 nanometer, uh, and uh, uh, the, which is governed by the peak intensity, and the efficient excitation of the atom, which is governed by the average intensity. Okay. Now, the frequency comb has a disadvantage as well because uh, it, it folds uh, the whole spectrum with the wrap rate of the fre frequency comb. And so you see that uh, over, um, uh, over 200, uh, 200 megahertz, you get all the various uh, hyperfine components into the, um, into the spectrum. Um, but you can adjust the repetition rate of the frequency comb such that, for example, this, this uh, um, f equal 1 to f equal 1 of the 3s state stands out uh, far detuned as far as possible from the other transitions that go to the D states, which are also excited by this um, laser. Now, um, this is the, the, the setup. We have a mode locked um, Tysaf laser, um, and then we have uh, two second harmonics. So we produce the fourth harmonic at 205 nanometers. And then uh, we, we split the beam and make, uh, in order to, to get the most out of this signal, we try to uh, we uh, excite the atom with counterpropagating left and right circular sigma plus and sigma minus uh, light. Um, so we we send in a pulse and uh, the same pulse with a delay line with the um, um, other helicity of the laser pulse. And then uh, this cavity makes the uh, the retro reflection. And then the, we have a pulse collision volume here. And we set this pulse collision volume, uh, you know, a few millimeters away from the, the nozzle where the hydrogen beam comes out. And this is where we do the spectroscopy. There's also hydrogen coming out on the other side. And we also look at um, the signal from this one. This is light, which is driven by just uh, um, two photons from the same pulse, whereas this light is mainly given by two photons from opposing pulses. And this spectrum here, um, this, um, um, this signal is independent on the, on the exact um, uh, on the uh, exact uh, laser uh, frequency because it's completely Doppler broadened. But this serves as a normalization for the signal that we see here that has turned out to be very uh, helpful. Um, here you see this again. This is the nozzle where the cold atoms come out. And then we have uh, different detectors looking at uh, different parts of the interaction volume of this pulse collision volume. And here we have the normalization detector. It's all fiber couples. And um, and then we have a large list uh, of um, systematics. Um, and we have nice statistics, but the total uh, uncertainty is, is governed by a, a set of uh, various uh, systematics. For example, um, there is uh, still a second order Doppler shift because of the motion of the atom. And we can investigate this by, by different uh, nozzle temperatures. And you see that um, this extrapolates to zero velocity. Um, this has been a very sophisticated analysis. And um, the result is. Um, that it's uh, a little bit more favorable or somewhat more favorable uh, for the um, for the small charge radius. It's in good uh, good agreement with the Codata 2018, but uh, it's, it's two sigmas away from the old Paris measurement. And the yeah, um, I would uh, get into troubles if I wouldn't advertise uh, our new um, Mainz electron accelerator, um, which is also aiming at, um, which is currently built on the campus uh, with funding from our excellence clusters. And um, um, we will uh, have this very nice uh, energy recovering uh, superconducting accelerator, MESA. And there's an experiment uh, called MAGIX, which also employs a windowless gas target. And we will get to the lowest Q square in elastic electron scattering. And we can do all these these uh, um, measurements with improved um, precision um, uh, soon on, on, on campus and might well soon once this, this thing is done. Okay, so um, this is the status of, of hydrogen with new uh, um, um, uh, papers coming out and having come out. Very quickly, we have done a spectroscopy in helium-3 and helium-4. Um, um, what has been uh, what is prepared for publication at the moment uh, is uh, Munich helium-4. The, the big news is that there is no news. Um, there's good agreement between um, uh, Munich helium-4, the charge radius, and the world data on electron scattering. Um, this is our spectra. This is the 2S2P3 uh, 2S2 half and the 2S2P1 half. You see, we had to scan quite a bit to find the resonance um, because this was in an early stage of the experiment. We scanned a very far region. 
Then when we found it, uh, it was uh, easy to find the other one. We didn't have to scan very far out. And we got uh, you know, 17 or 15 gigahertz of this accuracy. We get a charge radius with this value. The, the theory uncertainty uh, governs the error bar. Uh, this is this outer shaded error band, uh, which is the polarizability. And I've taken much too much time on the old stuff. Um, I would like to conclude that uh, muonic atoms uh, are um, um, a precision tool to study nuclear radii, charge radii, and polarizabilities. And uh, when you combine it with the calculated polarizability, you get the 10 times better charge radii um, than from electronic probes so far. Um, or if you get a charge radius from example, for example, from regular atoms, which will soon happen, for example, for the helium charge radius from, from helium plus spectroscopy, then you can use the, the muonic atoms to determine the nuclear polarizability. And that is a great new tool for, for proton and few nucleon uh, nucleate properties. There's a long list of uh, other experiments that have something to say about um, QED tests, the standard model tests, proton charge radius. Um, and, uh, and our contribution to this is um, that we want to measure not only the charge radius, but also the magnetic radius. Um, and um, the, uh, the muon, uh, both the muon and the, the, the proton have a spin magnetic moment, and uh, they also interact, and they give rise to the hyperfine splitting. And um, the hyperfine splitting is, is dominant uh, in, the, in the universe. Um, this is, if you look in hydrogen uh, spectroscopy or hydrogen frequencies, namely the famous 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. Um, if you look into the sky, you see gas clouds uh, in hydrogen, uh, which is from the ground set hyperfine splitting, which has been measured already 50 years ago with this astounding precision of 12 digits. Okay, so this is the, the measurement published in, in, in 1971. Um, of course, from a hydrogen maser of this 21 centimeter line. Now, if you do theory, you can only reproduce six out of these 12 digits because then the proton size and the proton polarizability, so these two photon exchange terms, um, come in, and they're not known with sufficient accuracy. Um, so the, the QED test and the standard model test is hampered by this ignorance of, uh, of a precise value of these two photon exchange terms. And uh, we are setting out to measure this uh, in muonic hydrogen, as well as two other collaborations um, at uh, Rutherford Appleton and at, at uh, J Park. Um, the hyperfine structure depends not on the magnetic charge ray, a magnetic radius, but on the so-called Zemach radius, which is a funny convolution of electric charge distribution and magnetization distribution, which was put, put forward by Zemach in this uh, paper. You can also, and that's very interesting, you can also um, get a handle on this uh, using electron scattering because it's just the product of form factors, the electric and the magnetic form factor. And um, so uh, in contrast to our previous measurement of the lamp shift, which gives you uh, information on the charge radius, we're now looking at the hyperfine splitting, which is sensitive to this Zemach radius. The Zemach radius has been determined by uh, hydrogen spectroscopy of the 21 centimeter line as well as electron scattering. And uh, this, these are the values. There's some disagreement. There seem to be some disagreement. But as I told you before, we've measured two transitions in muonic hydrogen for, to the 2S state, 2P state. And uh, this gives a crude number for the polarizability, uh, sorry, for the, for the Zemach radius as well from muonic hydrogen. But the goal of our new experiment is to get to an error bar of this size. And uh, the way to do, so this is the, the previous measurement. The way to do this is um, to go to the ground state. And um, our experiment will look like this. We have uh, muons stopped in hydrogen, very much similar to the measurement in, in, of the lamp shift, but now we can use a much higher target pressure. We had to use one millibar in the old times because we wanted to avoid quenching. Now we are using half a bar and we have to go to a cryogenic um, target of only 50 Kelvin or so. And, uh, Important. That's nice about this homeschooling uh, because you can just drink your coffee and can, nobody can complain that I'm drinking a coffee now. Um, so you, you make muonic oops you make muonic hydrogen atoms in the one is ground state. These are the 99% that gave rise to this prompt peak before. And uh, after some collisions, the all the atoms will sit in the uh, F equals zero, M F equals zero state in the lowest ground state. 
And then you make laser excitation and go to the F equal one state. Um, and uh, that gives, uh, that is also six or seven micron now, 6.8 micron. That's 180 milli electron volts that you pump into this uh, atom. And in the next collision with the hydrogen molecule of the target gas, this spin can flip again. And this 180 milli electron volts can be converted into kinetic energy. So you get something like 90 milli electron volt of kinetic energy, which is a little bit higher than the uh, thermal uh, kinetic energy. And so these atoms which have experienced laser excitation are a little bit faster and they will run to the walls of the target, which, is only, which are only two millimeters away, uh, in a slightly shorter time compared to the normal diffusion of uh, muonic hydrogen atoms that have not been illuminated by laser. So um, when the, muon, the muonic hydrogen atom arrives at the, at the wall, it transfers the muon to a gold layer and the gold produces muonic gold X-rays at high energy of mega electron volts and we can, um, we can detect this with, with scintillators. We have done lots of beam tests already and we are building a, a laser. We again use our workhorse, this uh, thin disk laser with lots of pump power. We need this awkward wavelength and we need um, you know, uh, 10 times more energy uh, or more than 10 times more pulse energy than we did before. And the most important uh, thing is that we need um, a very good line width because our previous laser with the Raman cell had a line width of, of you know, gigahertz. And now we have to go below 100 megahertz if we want to measure uh, a precision, do a precision measurement. So we will use this um, thin disk laser in single frequency operation. Um, and then we use um, uh, OPOS, um, optical parametric oscillators. This is the several schemes on the market now. One is uh, using 1550 telecom and a 2000 nanometer um, um, cedar and then uh, produce uh, light at um, 2100 and 3200 nanometer. And then we make different frequency to get to 6.8 micron. Um, we are working on, on uh, various approaches, uh, different ways how you can get to this. Each of them has an advantage and a drawback. And we're doing parallel investigations of, of how we get to this, uh, to this uh, awkward wavelength. A big, a big problem is that we don't know, again, we don't know where to look at, because uh, if you look at the prediction uh, of, the, uh, of the position, um, depending on the, the uh, polarizability or the two photon exchange contribution of the, of the hyperfine splitting in Munich hydrogen, you have lots of, lots of predictions. And uh, which means if we have to be prepared to measure five sigma left and right again, then this is uh, exaggerated the line width. Uh, we will have to measure 450 data points. Each of them takes, you know, six hours. And that is months of search for the resonance. So any, advan uh, any advancement in, in the precision of these, of these calculations, of the difficult nucleon structure calculations, uh, will, will shave off lots of data taking time from our experiments. Um, yeah, our plan was uh, this year to find the resonance, but of course uh, PSI is in hibernation and um, we're also not really 100% ready to do this. Uh, but we want to start next year and uh, measure this hyperfine uh, structure and get to this, um, to this precise value of the Seemach radius and learn more about magnetization distribution and improve the QED test on the hyperfine structure by a factor of maybe 50. In the future, um, if you look at the chart that I showed you in the beginning, uh, you see that um, there are several nuclei which have embarrassingly large uncertainties. Um, this is an electron, electron scattering uncertainty. And of course, nobody wants to have a, you know, a gigantic tritium box and, and, and hammer electrons in an electron uh, accelerator in there. Uh, and also the absolute charge radii from the lithium uh, atom, they are already quite small from electron scattering, but we can improve on this and also on the beryllium uh, um, by, by going to muons, of course. Um, we have uh, built a, a setup for the lamp shift measurement in muonic hydrogen, where we produce um, two kilo electron volt X-ray, uh, sorry, two kilo electron volt uh, kinetic energy muons, and they are detected. And if we continue, uh, we could build a, a pulse drift tube triggered on the um, arrival of a muon, and, um, and when the, while the muon is in the drift tube, you ramp a high voltage, and when the muon gets out, it sees a counter uh, voltage depending on the, the time it spent inside this, this drift tube. And with that, you could slow down this from uh, a kilo electron volt, maybe 200 electron volts or lower, 
And then this would be enough to make a, a, a thick lithium target. Um, and then you could produce a, a laser pulse. The laser pulse is a bit tricky. Um, this is the level scheme of, of uh, muonic lithium-6. And um, if you look at the two strongest lines, the blue one and the red one, um, they change um, the wavelength a lot depending on uh, which uh, charge radius of the uh, lithium-6 nucleus you believe. So uh, you see this is plus minus three sigma, and this goes from 550 to 850 nanometers. So this will be you know, a, a set of, of dye lasers or or uh, not so very sophisticated lasers, but you need a lot of pulse energy. Um, but I think that would be doable. Um, you see that the natural line width is very large, so you only have to measure on something on the order of 50 data, uh, the, uh, measurement points, but you have to scan basically the whole half of the, of the visible region. Um, Munich lithium-7, uh, it goes down to lower wavelengths and, and up to higher wavelengths. Um, and, uh, um, the theory is on a, on a good, uh, on a, in a good status already. It has, it's improving. Um, um, in the end, we will get a, a charge radius uh, which can be improved by a factor of 10 because of the polarizability, which is the current polarizability uh, uh, determination from nuclear modeling, the best on the market. Our experiment would be good to improve it by another factor of 10. So we could improve uh, by a factor of 100, um, but um, polarizability uh, gives us, you know, only a factor of 10 better charge radius, which would already be, be quite nice. Um, and um, there are, there are uh, experiments um, on the way and proposed um, uh, to, uh, to measure lithium plus, um, uh, which will helium-like, and with the advancement of, um, of the, the three-body theory for the helium atoms, um, you would have a nice way to test, you know, QED and, and the standard model from Z equals one, two, three, and determine charge radii and, and polarizability is all a factor of 10 to 100 better. You could also go to beryllium, but that's a, a dream at the moment. You have to slow down the muons to much less than uh, one electron volt energy, and we have done simulations. It's not completely out of the question. There, the same thing applies. Our experiment would be good enough to, to uh, approve everything by two orders of magnitude, but the uh, polarizability uh, is not known well enough. Um, and the, the last thing I would like to talk about today is um, uh, the triton charge radius, because um, the triton radio, the, the triton is the, the mirror, a mirror nucleus to helium-3, and the nuclear physicists would love to look at you know, isospin effects in the three uh, nuclear forces. And, uh, um, you could improve this by a factor of 400 uh, by doing laser spectroscopy of normal atoms. Um, I told you that the best deuteron radius, this value, comes from the muonic hydrogen proton radius, this one, and the electronic isotope shift. So you measure the one as two as transition here and there in normal atoms, and from this you get this one. If you measure the one as two as transition in tritium, in atomic tritium, you could improve this by a factor of 400. And we've started an experiment in, in mind now. Um, where we want to trap hydrogen atoms first by uh, using a code nozzle uh, similar to the, the Garching setup and selecting the slow velocity atoms from this um, just for the hydrogen atoms now for the time being uh, by going around the curved magnetic quadrupole guide and then use a lithium mod, um, a, a thick lithium mod as a cold buffer gas to trap hi um, hydrogen atoms inside a, a, a magnetic trap. Um, it's not as sophisticated as the, um, by far not as sophisticated as the alpha uh, magnetic trap, but you know, you've seen in, in alpha and antihydrogen that you can do spectroscopy of, of individual hydrogen-like atoms uh, in, in um, magnetic setup with great accuracy of, you know, 12 digits for the one is two is transition antihydrogen. If we were to get to 12 digits in, in, in atomic tritium, we would improve um, this charge radius by a factor of 400 already. That's a one kilohertz measurement. Um, that's 100 times less precise than what we've done in Garching for, for hydrogen deuterium, but the same level as, as the alpha has done for anti-hydrogen. So it's not out of reach. And um, this is, the, again, the setup. Um, we have uh, an atomic hydrogen source. This is the, the Balma series light that you see shining from our radio frequency discharge. And we've measured beam profiles here. This is the hydrogen beam profile, which we measured with a with a thin uh, wire chamber wire where the hydrogen atoms recombine and, and, and produce heat, which you can then record as a change of, of resistance. So we are um, 
we are uh, investigating our hydrogen formation and optimizing it and, and, and beam formation. And then we have built a, a prototype of this magnetic quadrupole from commercial fridge magnets, um, but they still have 0.7 Tesla on the, on the surface. And uh, so a hydrogen atom sees something like this when it comes out of the nozzle. And the slow ones should go around the corner while the fast ones leave on this slit and can be pumped away. We're at the moment testing this, um, this uh, uh, quadrupole guide with the rubidium source, which is down here. And we, we've seen a, a rubidium beam here and we are measuring its velocity. But we have not seen any guiding yet. And uh, now at the moment, there's nobody in the lab in, in mind. Actually, we've just restarted with a very small amount of people in the labs allowed. And uh, I hope we can see guiding on this, on this uh, prototype and then we can put it in. And we have a lithium mod apparatus that is used for something else at the moment, but we are learning how to make a lithium mod. And this has restarted yesterday also, and we are uh, Siemens lower, um, which had some problems here at the oven, the Siemens lower, and we have a mod set up. So we're getting back to, to uh, normal. And uh, well, I hope that um, sometime, uh, maybe towards the end of the year, we can think of, of doing um, trapping of hydrogen. And um, um, we've just gotten a, um, a 243 nanometer laser, so we can do laser spectroscopy in this. And um, so uh, last word on this, um, this trapping actually looks, if you do a simple uh, simulation, if you get to 10 to the 10 lithium atoms in the one centimeter diameter, which is what other people have done, the trapping efficiency is 10 to minus four for hydrogen, uh, but uh, the larger mass of tritium would actually improve the trapping if everything else was the same. Um, so uh, if we learn to do this with, uh, with uh, um, hydrogen, and if we get above 10 to the nine atoms per cubic centimeter, then we should be able to, to trap other atoms as well. And with that, and with all the people who did all the work, uh, I would like to thank you. Um, this is the group from last summer. And uh, if you're looking for a PhD or a postdoc, uh, please um, email me uh, on this one. Thank you. <laughs>